Hello, this is Brian Kinghorn, and I'm going to talk to you about the Make Cell Frontier. And this is a graphical tool for illustrating the relationship between genetic gain and genetic diversity, and helping you to manage these two things, how they compete with each other, and how they compete with all the other issues that are confronting you in the breeding program. So this is the first of three videos. We'll talk about Frontier Fundamentals, then we'll move on to working with balance strategies, which help you to manage the frontier and where you end up on it. And lastly, we'll ask where we should aim on the frontier. So this is what the frontier looks like in mate cell graphical user interfaces. And the axes are genetic gain and the progeny or progeny index and parental co-ancestry, which is a measure of diversity. So for co-ancestry, we want to be to the left where there's more diversity as opposed to the right, where there's more long-term inbreeding. And for the progeny index, we want high genetic gain up here. So we want to be in this quadrant or somewhere like it. And the population that you've got determines the extent to which you can push in each direction. And the frontier illustrates that for you. So let's look at these two axes, X prime G, and this one, the parental co-ancestry. In mate cell, the vector X is actually used to hold the number of matings allocated to each male candidate and to each female candidate. But for the illustration here, we're going to look at these contributions in proportional terms, so that for males, they sum to a half, and females, they sum to a half. It's the calculation of the contribution of that individual to the next generation. And the rightmost column here, G, is a prediction of the genetic merit calculated outside mate cell for each candidate. It's an index value typically across traits. And to get a prediction of the average genetic merit in the progeny, all we have to do is multiply each of these contributions by the genetic merits and add them up, which is the same as multiplying vector x with vector g. Here, mean progeny index is predicted in this way. So we want to push this one upwards genetic gain, whereas mean parental co-ancestry, we want to reduce this one x prime a x over 2, a is the numerator relationship matrix or the genomic relationship matrix. There are two x's in here, and this is because we are interested in minimizing inbreeding, many ways of describing this. What we don't want to get is a bad mutation from your father and from your mother. The probability of that happening is the product of the probability of receiving that from the father and the mother. And that's just basically indicating to you why we have two x's in here to manage diversity. The best way to keep this value low is to spread our contributions so that the contents of x is small numbers, because a small number times a small number is a very small number. Whereas if the contributions were concentrated only on a few individuals, then there's less that reducing effect. Why do we have an a in here? Well, I'll illustrate that to you briefly here. It turns out that if we don't have an A in there, X prime X is actually equal to the classic formula for predicting the rate of change in inbreeding. And I'm not going to go through the details in those two slides, but if you want to look at this, you'll see illustration that for different scenarios, e.g. two males and two females, these two things are in actual fact equal. There's another one here. So what we want to do, of course, is to spread the contributions in X quite thin and we get a good result with lower long-term inbreeding rate. However, what is the A in there for? Well, that's illustrated in the next slide. So let's consider the scenario where we have three individual males and we want to know what contribution we should allow them to have in the next generation. So simply, we would just give them a third each if we wanted to spread the contributions and minimize X prime X over two, the rate of inbreeding predicted in the simple classic way. However, with knowledge of pedigree, and hence the numerator relationship matrix, if the first two males are full sibs to each other, and the third male, according to the shallow pedigree, is unrelated, then this male is more useful because it's more new blood, and it should have more contribution than the other two. And when we do the calculations, we find indeed that it does. It should have a three to two to two relationship. And we do that by using the numerator relationship matrix in x prime ax over 2, and that gives us this result. So that's why we use the numerator relationship matrix for calculating parental co-ancestries with a bit more fidelity than the old-fashioned way.
So now I'm going to use a simple example to give you a better feel for x prime g and x prime ax, which is parental co-ancestry. In this case, I'm not dividing it by two, so it's not quite parental co-ancestry, just for simplicity. Why do we divide by two? Well, if we had two full sibs, they share half their alleles in common by descent, and so their NRM element is 0.5. However, if you cross them, the inbreeding coefficient in the progeny is expected to be 0.25, which is a half of x prime ax. And that's why we divide x prime ax by two. For this example, we're putting zero emphasis on co-ancestry, looking only at genetic gain. And we have two candidate males and two candidate females. And the current solution is giving all the contributions to the first male and first female. And the reason for that is with no emphasis on co-ancestry, the genetic merit of the first male and first female is such that we would give them all the contributions. If we now look and see what's happening if we give essentially overriding emphasis to co-ancestry, we see that the contributions are now spread equally among the four individuals in order to maximize genetic diversity. So let's go ahead and see if the first male and first female were full sibs to each other, that's a 50% uh, element in the NRM. Then if I optimize that, we find that the first male and first female have a lower contribution to the population in the long run because they are related to each other and have less to give for long-term genetic diversity than the other male and female, which are not related to each other. What we can also do with this is draw a frontier. I can just do that by looping through different values of lambda. So if you look at this graph down here and see the coordinates of 0.25 and 100, if I do a new graph for where there's a relationship involved there, then there's a slightly higher co-ancestry is the minimum that can be achieved with that relationship. And there's a little bit of a change in genetic merit as well, because we are going to be using more of the less meritorious male and female, because our emphasis at this point on the frontier is to go for minimum co-ancestry. And in all cases, when you're only interested in genetic merit, the best outcome is 110 units with the first male and first female. So I'm going to finish by looking at some other types of frontier, which probably helps to give a feel for what's going on. This is actually a frontier where there is competition between two traits as opposed to two different issues, which is what we handle in mate cell frontier. So here we've got fiber diameter and fleece weight in sheep. And you start here and in a given period of time, you can have genetic merit of the population land anywhere on this yellow ellipse as a function of the relative weighting that you give to each in an index to push them. So if we look at the single trait selection responses, if we select only for fiber diameter, we would end up here with a positive correlated response in fleece weight because of the positive correlation between them. But this is indeed a frontier that you cannot leave just by having a certain amount of emphasis on each, you will be somewhere on this frontier. The next type of frontier is one that you can be on the inside like here. So you can be on the outside for this is two different traits and there are other traits involved here. So I can be on the outside by clicking up here and that's the best response in that direction for those traits. But I can also be inside that frontier if I want to select for other traits which take away from the maximal response you would get here. And again, this is a frontier which is relatively simple because it's made up of competition between different traits as opposed to different issues. And lastly, we'll go and look at another type of frontier here. So this module diversity, which is part of GenUp that you can download on the internet, is a little bit similar to mate cell in that it's balancing genetic variance or genetic diversity with merit. But in this setting, we're looking at a conservation program where we're looking at how to manage different populations and how much emphasis to put on each of them. And the genetic variance is measured by total allelic diversity across a number of different markers. That's not critically important. I just want to show you how this one operates. If I say I want to be at this place in their balance between merit and diversity and I click, I get this unusual response. What is happening here is the evolutionary algorithm is aiming to find that place, but every time it puts up a solution, it plots that on the graph as a pixel, and then you see that cloud. So there are two messages here. One is that even though you have a deal of complexity for those two different issues, you can actually say, I just want to be close to a certain place. Then the algorithm works with Euclidean distance and Pythagoras and simply aims to find a coordinate 
on the solution, which is close to where you want to be. The other thing is that by clicking in different places, I'm clicking saying I want to be here, I want to be here, we start to see the whole response surface for these two issues. And for example, back here with low genetic variance, what we're looking at is selecting single populations. So in this case, population four gets all of the attention for the conservation program. And if I click up here, it's population five, etc. Now, this shows an interesting shape, which can be quite informative, but where you want to be is high variance and high merit. So although it's reversed compared to the mate cell frontier, this is the place of interest to be up here. And when we then go and look at the mate cell situation, we want to be up here. But there is a frontier that goes all the way around, but these other quadrants are less interesting for us. And this approach of targeting coordinates on graphs is used in mate cell I, and of course you don't see it, but it is a simple and effective way of achieving outcomes. And lastly, I want to finish off by illustrating that this formula here gives us optimal contributions. And this follows an excellent paper by Theo Miosen in 1997. I wanted to use this not for individuals, but for families. And this was an example in prawns. So I, I wrote my own version of Theo's code and looped through Lambda. Uh, and here is a frontier that we got. Now these two solutions are what was being doing in the breeding program with the standard approach. And then some experts went and hand curated a result doing the best things that you might expect to do to having greater diversity. And as is often the case when using these approaches, we get a better result when we go and use this sort of approach to do optimal contributions. And this means that we have the ability to use better individuals allocate them more mates than we otherwise would do. And compensation for doing that is found in other parts of the breeding program to manage diversity. And the end result is you get a better combination of both genetic gain and co-ancestry. It's definitely worth doing. So that's the end of this video on frontier fundamentals. We'll go on to look at working with balanced strategies to see how to achieve different places on the frontier and as close as possible to the frontier, depending on what competing interests are also in the objective function. And lastly, we'll have a video discussing where we should aim on the frontier. Thank you for listening.